Fraternal organization was formed, uh, which brought Norris Khan 2 and Norris Khan 3, and also one of the SMOF cons. And we're going to be putting on another SMOF con and the World Fantasy con. So that's sort of, you know, from about <coughs> 39 to present to <coughs> fast. And I, and I think maybe we start and get Harry's information on the stranger point uh, while he's chewing his ice. I caught him with his. <laughs> oh, sorry, I almost swallowed the stuff. Um, Actually, my contact started in '42. Uh, the Stranger Club was uh, well, certainly not a current type of science fiction organization. It met invariably at the home of Robert Swisher in uh, Winchester, because Robert had a collection of all the magazines that there were. And in those days, science fiction fans read science fiction. And this was our principal reading, meeting for re meeting reason for meeting. Sorry, uh, they I didn't discover them; they discovered me. Uh, Swisher was a close friend of John Campbell's, and when Campbell bought my first story in October of uh, '41, apparently he told Swisher about me because just about the time the story appeared in the June '42 issue, I got a call from Swisher telling me about the group and uh, inviting me to come over, which I promptly did. Uh, as I say, there were no meetings in any ordinary sense of the word. People would arrive, they would settle down in Bob's uh, study, start reading something they had not read before. <laughs> this is when I got most of my Doc Smith read. I, I was a little late to catch uh, the early Skylarks, even, even in getting into magazine fandom, but only a little. Uh, I was a purist in those days. Uh, he did have copies of Unknown and Weird Tales, but uh, even then I was sort of a hard science fiction prejudice type. <laughs> Shocking, I know. And uh, especially for a guy who was now hooked on Terry Pratchett. Well, I did Well, it's alternate know. physics. Yeah, no. <laughs> all right, all right. Be that as it may, uh, we would simply sit there. Uh, uh, Bob had some sort of music player. It would not, be, not have been called a hi-fi system in those days, but generally there was music going on, or maybe it was a radio. Anyway, noise was coming in and <laughs> being vaguely listened to. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes not so vaguely. I distinctly remember hearing, first hearing Waltzing Matilda on that instrument, <laughs> and liking it enough to go out and find the sheet music and uh, learning the song. I was reminded of that last night, Pierre, when you uh, rattled the tune off. Uh, anyway, we would sit there, we would read, somebody would occasionally say something, but not <laughs> often. Uh, somewhere in the middle of the afternoon, Bob's wife would come in with refreshments, and we would eat with one hand and read with the other, and that was substantially it, eventually. Since very few of us, if any of us had cards, it was time to uh, catch the L and uh, or its equivalents. We were outside the elevated lines uh, and uh, go back home. But uh, it was there that uh, I had my longest meeting and conversation with Ron Hubbard. He was at a meeting. Uh, must have, it was July or August of summer of 42. At this point, he was not preaching Dianetic Scientology or anything else of the sort. Uh, I don't, well, he didn't publish the Dianetics article 50. until 50, so uh, maybe he hadn't thought of it yet, but I don't know. Uh, that was substantially it. They, we did put on a, they apparently had put on a Boscone or so beforehand. The first one I attended was in February of 43, and there were, I guess, about 40 people uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. There was an art auction. I got a, an interior illo and old amazing for 15 cents. And we put on a play, a takeoff on uh, Jack Williamson with a fearsome weapon called the Cackle Cackle. <laughs> yes, I know, that, that was what it was supposed to take off from, but uh, we called it the Cackle Cackle. And no one, of course, had learned any lines, so we all did our parts. <laughs> See, nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> Some things don't change. And uh, 
within a couple of weeks of that, I went off into the Army. So uh, that, that's where I lost contact with the strangers. They didn't exist for any real practical purpose by the time I got back. Just as a note, there's in the Norris Country Program Book and the progress reports, each of the surviving strangers wrote up their, their memories of the, uh, the club. And so anybody who's doing research could, could use that. I believe there were four of the initial bosses, the first series boss cards, which ranged in the size from Harry said 40, and some of that, that's seven, roughly, you know. I don't trust my mind. memory. And then right after the war, um, they held a very small convention called the Northeast Science Fiction Convention, because they wanted to say it was the first science fiction convention held after the war. I believe it was held like a week after BJ Day. Uh, it didn't have very many people. No. Um, and then... I was in Spokane at the time. <laughs> Uh, there was almost no activity um, until around 49 when the MIT Science Fiction Society was founded. Uh, and for many years, their main activity was, was to hold meetings at which absolute nonsense was discussed. And I, believe, I don't believe Mitzvah has changed at all. Uh, <laughs> not in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> and their major project was to microfilm astoundings. Uh, when I joined in, in 57, uh, the project had been in abeyance for a while. They had some microfilm, but not all. Uh, the entire Mitzvah's library, which now was about 50 or 65,000 volumes, all fit in one coop crate, which was stored in the bottom of one of the dormitories and not accessible. Um, and I guess what really got things going is I, my first year when I went home at Thanksgiving, I told my father that I had joined the Science Fiction Society, and he said, oh, when I was younger, <laughs> Uh, and was into radio. His call letters were 2RY, which gives you some idea of how many, what way back that goes in ham radio. Um, he said there was a guy in our club uh, who was really like science fiction, and he even tried to write it in a magazine. Maybe you've heard of him. His name was Hugo Bernsback. I said, yes, we've heard of him. <laughs> and I didn't think anything. I got, went back to school. I get a call it's from Hugo Bernsback. He says, your father called and said there's a science fiction club at MIT. Would you like me to come up and speak to you? <laughs> so we said, sure, yeah, come on up. And he came up and gave this very portentous speech on, on a new need for a new name for science fiction, which, he, which we still don't have. Uh, but that wasn't the interesting thing. Before his schedule, uh, John Raven. Yes, I met, about this time, I'm, I was in a second-hand bookstore in New York called Science Fiction and Fantasy Publications. Got, oh, what's his name? Um, Bertie? No, no. Uh, same name as the guy that did the first magazine index. Day. 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 Oh, Day. Yeah. This was Bradford Brad M. Day. Day. Yes, he had a bookstore out in Queens. Yeah. And I was in his bookstore in Queens, and I ran into this guy. And we talked. And he said about how you know, he's with the MIT club. And I arranged at that time, I just started publishing fanzines myself. And I arranged to trade my fanzine for Twilight Zine, you know, with him. And through him, I got to know Mike Ward. After, uh, and then somehow, when I, when I moved east, I, uh, uh, I don't know how I, I made, con uh, I used to stay with Mike Ward when I'd come down to Boston for a weekend. I used to come down and go to a mistress meeting. Later, when Mike moved away, I don't know how I ended up staying at your place in Somerville. Everybody did. Belmont. Belmont. Yeah. Everybody did. Not so much. Belmont. Oh, no. Brookline. Brookline. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was before we moved. That was when we had this huge apartment. Yeah, yeah. I remember, you know, I first stayed at a place called The Dump or something like that. In it was, I think it was <laughs> filthy. It was Ed Mayer and Mike Ward had this yeah. apartment in this really run-down apartment house. <laughs> Everybody else in, who, uh, in that house was Hispanic. Yeah, 116 Broadway, <laughs> fourth floor. Yeah. Uh, Broadway was sort of at the low point in everybody's life in Cambridge. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And I remember coming in this, this, you know, I moved to New Hampshire in January 66 and I wanted fan contacts. And then in 67 I took over the Tolkien Society and I started running Tolkien meetings at the annual Bosco. I remember, the, uh, I missed Bosco in one of the new series, but I was at Bosco in two. 
and I think it was Bosco and four, there were only two non-Boston people, myself and a guy from Rhode Island uh, who's now dead, Mike, Mark Walstead. Yeah. Yes. Um, because Bosco and four, they were going to, Dave Vanderwolf was going to start doing Boscones twice a year. <laughs> and the alternate Boscone was going to be just a money raiser to, to milk MIT students of money <laughs> with, to, to help support the club. And it was just... Another tradition of carrying out the president. And the whole of Bosco, I think it was Bosco in four, was just movies. It was a total movie convention. All he did was show movies all day <laughs> for two days. I must have been Bill Desmond. <laughs> <laughs> In the uh, late 50s, um, Mitzvahs uh, finally got a room and started building a library. Uh, that was about the time you showed up. Yeah, I showed up for a good time. Sit up straight here. I want to say, how many of you people believe this man is a trained killer and an ex-Marine? <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you talk, Richard came in. Um, he was originally from South Dakota. Yeah. You're still from South. Yeah, I'm still from South. <laughs> <laughs> still from it's South. hard. To, it's hard to get out of this. But uh, you were working as a programmer, and mathematician. Yeah. And um, why don't you pick that up from there? Uh, well, I was working on it like in labs. Uh, actually, Air Force Cambridge Research Labs, which is on Hanscom Field, and uh, Fuzzy Pink and uh, Natalie Urban were working there. No. Uh, Fuzzy Pig went off to marry Larry Niven at some point later. Uh, they, fell, they fell into each other's arms and, was it, Nikon? Nikon. And Nikon. It was amazing. Yeah. It was like a Hollywood movie. Yeah. They saw each other and they basically floated up, you, know, you could almost hear the music, and they drifted off out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and a year later they were married. Yeah, very sweet. <laughs> um, yeah, Fuzzy, uh, they, had to move, they had the first PDP-1 and they had to to move it from one building to another. In those days, the computer was, yeah, PDP-1 was only about yay big, or you know, it was a mini only, computer. Yeah, it was a mini computer. You could uh, fit it in one room. And it cost less than a million dollars. Yeah. Uh, so, it took, so it took them uh, two months to get their project up and running, but it totally took space, uh, space war one day. <laughs> <laughs> so things haven't changed. Yeah, so um, yeah, Natalie told me to come down to, uh, Mitzvah, so I went down to this building, Walker building, and down in a basement, and there's uh, a lot of moldy people there. Fit <laughs> right in. Yeah, fit right in. Uh, and uh, there's this strange person sitting there reading letter, reading out loud from letters from the earth. Hasn't changed anything. <laughs> uh, and so Mitzvah in those days um, was pretty not, pretty silly. Doesn't change much, is <laughs> Yeah. Does it change, Eddie? Um. Well, you. It's, it's a little more ponderous, but. A little uh, more ponderous. Still, you, you have better facilities. I that, yeah. We're awfully cramped. That hasn't changed. Oh, no, that didn't. Yeah. The uh, there were magazines and books all over the place. Uh, here was uh, uh, rescuing things from the light bulb farm and bringing them in. Uh, light bulb farm is. Where light bulbs go to retire. <laughs> uh, there were, um, well, actually, ins I liked Insanity. Oh, yes, oh, yes. great game. <laughs> uh, this is perhaps representative. Uh, <laughs> Tony and I and other people would play a game called Insanity. We had lots of Coke cases with Coke bottles. And so you take a Coke case, uh, which held it, and uh, some number of Coke bottles in that, and start making moves. And the real principle of the game was that you were <coughs> making moves and playing a game and doing gamesmanship like things. And anybody who watched it uh, would think that you were really playing a game of some kind. <laughs> you were, but you were playing with their mind. Yeah, you were playing with their mind. <laughs> and the whole object is to see how long you can keep people uh, figuring out how, what the rules were. And you explained it and you could tell for you. It's easy, it's obvious. Ah. It was funny when you'd be doing You're very dramatic, you know. <laughs> and when someone would say, wait a minute, I think that's an illegal move. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. He said, he said, not if it's a prime number move. <laughs> um, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but, um, 
sort of an R form of elusis. At, so, at some point, um, yeah. <laughs> reverse elusis, I believe, would be the right. state it was. <laughs> the Boston Science Fiction Society was founded, and uh, I, I wasn't really involved with that, but it had people like Dave Vanderwer, Mike Ward, Owen Strauss, Alma Hill, um, Ed Paul Galvin, uh, Leslie Turek, some of these names maybe. And a, a new fan to the area, a new neo fan, a guy named Benjamin W. Bova, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who uh, was marketing manager at Africa ever. Uh, you know, nobody's ever heard of these names before. But, uh, and they put on Boscoins 1, 2, 4, and 5. Pierre himself put on Boscoin 3. <coughs> yes? Nestle put on Boscoin 1. Okay, not confused. Fine. That was a transition. Yeah. You're right, yes. Yeah. Good. Mark that down for the record, Boston 5 is the best record. Yeah, oh, and also if you're marking down Boston 3, Isaac Asimov was a guest of honor there, which has never been shown in the printed history, uh -huh. <laughs> along with John W. Campbell. I take, I take pride in that. I don't think they ever, they, we will never see that guest lineup again. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in this world. Well, I, hope not. <laughs> well, I don't know, we could clone them. There must be enough around to clone them. Um, one of the main purposes of the Boston Science Fiction Society was to bid then for the 66 World Con, which later became the 67 World Con. And the but bidding, never became the 68 World Con. Right. Um, the bidding was, I forget what the bidding was held, but anyway, uh, there were four cities vying. It was Boston. The bidding was held in Cleveland. In Cleveland, right, which is one year in advance. So it was Boston, uh, Syracuse, which was Dave Kyle's, <coughs> uh, New York, and whatever, <coughs> which I forget. Uh, maybe in Washington or Philadelphia. Anyway, uh, at that time there was no mail vote. So basically everybody poured into a room uh, and by a voice vote or showing their hands voted for the... But Boston went in with pretty strong support. Dave Vanderwerf made an impassioned plea and lost, to the extent that he lost almost every support that he had. <laughs> um, mostly he got up there and accused uh, various New York fans of, of trashing his name. And, <laughs> it, was a, it was a magazine that called, fo called Focal Point, which was a news zine, yeah. and fairly partisan. I think it was Rich Brown's news zine, right? Uh, Arnie Kent. Arnie Kent, Arnie Kent. Yeah, okay. Brown. Yeah. Uh, after that, the, it was sort of decided by the people who weren't active in Bosphorus that maybe Bosphorus had outlived this. <laughs> and um, right after Nikon, we all got together and decided we'd form a new club. Um, whose name we had to decide, we didn't decide on it either. The problem was that things based on mitzvahs didn't work because it was a college organization. It had a turnover, and there were things that college organizations just couldn't do. Um, Harder thought of the original name for the Nesfo, which was the Adorians, because we were always the good guys. <laughs> but it, it, and the interesting thing was that there was at that time a club called the Eastern Science Fiction Association, which was based in Newark. And somebody said, well, if we call ourselves Nespro, they're going to confuse us with ESPA. And nobody will ever be able to. And somebody else said, if we operate correctly in a few years, nobody will ever remember what ESPA was. Uh, so Nespa had its, a news uh, a Gen Z, which Dinus Bisniex came up with the name, which was proper Bosconian. There were other suggestions. I think Leslie's suggestion was to call it the Fenway, which, by the way, is available to anyone who wants to write a Boston-based fanzine. Um, Leslie also suggested what is now MCFI could be called Condom, but, <laughs> which shows you where her mind works. <laughs> <laughs> or that means the case, maybe. The first editor of Proper Bosconian was and then Corey Seidman, who laid him out married Alex A. Panchino was carried off to the wilds of Pennsylvania and never seen her again. Um, and it's <coughs> that Mr. Hodder became editor. Yes, yes, yes. And he, he can tell you about the marvelous things he did. Well, I, ran, I published large quantities of artwork. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a, actually, that's when we got the Gestetner. That's uh, a story in that, too. Yeah, we... Uh, well, Nespo was not the rich and powerful and uh, well-to-do uh, <laughs> publishing and real estate conglomerate uh, <laughs> that it is today. Uh, in those days, uh, we had uh, virtually no money. Um, actually, uh, 
Uh, you didn't mention the index. Why? Uh, Mr. Strauss put together an index. Uh, was it uh, 50? 51 to 65? Yeah, 51 to 65 Definitely. on computer cards uh, using the technology of the day. People remember computer cards? Um, still have uh, yeah, <laughs> on the New Jersey Turnpike, which is always where we said it would be the last place to get out of it. <laughs> they still have them. Uh, so, um, you sold a bunch, as I recall, you sold a bunch of them and then uh, got drafted. Got drafted. Well, well, which was going to be a Mitzvahs project. Yeah. And then that fell through, and then the Wild Technology Press was a possibility. But uh, we finally decided to, to keep it in fandom. Mm -hmm. And when I got drafted, I essentially. Uh, handed the torch to, to Nespa. Well, the printer reclaimed the books because that's how we got. Yeah, I mean, it went through it went through the printer, but basically yeah. uh, that was that was for non-payment, I believe. Yes, that, <laughs> yeah, that was the idea. Yeah. Then that that, that uh, the Nespa would then uh, cut a deal with the with the printer. So and we we you did the negotiation. Yeah, I did the negotiation. Uh, I I don't remember. But I think they wanted is I think we got them for fifty cents a book. Fifty cents a book. Yeah. We offered 31 cents, and for some reason they said 51, and we said 50, and they said 30. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, you know, it, um, what do we sell them for? $8. $8. You know, we buy them for 50 eight. cents, sell them for $8. That way you make a 3% profit. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so that was a major operation, uh, so we issued bonds for that. Mm -hmm. um, we had these uh, ditto bonds. You know, people, people loan money, club money, and uh, we had these ditto bonds that uh, uh, paid five percent interest. Yeah, yeah. that was good money. Obviously. Yeah. If uh, Nespa cares, there is still in my backyard study a steel nine drawer Hallworth card uh, file case uh, which belongs to Nespa. Is it full of cards? No, there are no cards in it. Gosh. You did take those. Uh, I don't know what we use it for, but if you want it out, we'll come and get it. Uh, it would probably be harder to disinter it from the various things that you piled up in the top of it in the last 15 or 20 yeah. years. Yeah. That, that gets to be a problem. Um, and so there was that project, and so that was the big money maker for NASP because we could uh, sell indexes. We bring in hundreds of dollars a year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and because we now had uh, some money coming in, uh, a furniture store, Putnam Furniture, was selling off their Gestetner 466, which he used to run off broadsides and, uh, and electro stencils. Uh, and this was used, but it was in very good condition, so we went down and uh, hawked our soul, you know, put the club into debt for years, and acquired this magic machine. Uh, and I became the uh, keeper of the Gestetner for several years. Uh, and so when Corey got through uh, being uh, paired to being an editor, uh, I had volunteered for it because I had no experience whatsoever, this, so therefore I was qualified. Uh, Which is to say, no any better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what year was this? Uh, let's right? see, it would have been... Uh, this, when we got to the Gestetner? Yeah. Yeah. It was in the summer of 70, because it was just before we all left for high time. Mm -hmm. the, uh, so, yeah. <coughs> uh, so we had that uh, long time. Yes, and I remember around the same time then you got a real deal on a Japanese rotary <coughs> silk screen called a Giha or something. The Giha? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I remember the Giha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it was just like a Gestetner yeah. or a rotary yeah. silk what? screen. Yeah. I was the keeper of the gate yeah. for a couple of years. I think I took it to Worcester with me to call it. Do you still have it? No, I gave it back to the Because mm -hmm. if you still had it, we would make a gift of it. <laughs> <laughs> then you, you don't need to return it. The, uh, we still have some of those machines. It's almost impossible to get Dave Anderson to allow us to throw anything away. <laughs> <laughs> says, what if we need it? Put them in mm -hmm. this department. We can't because it's full up with other stuff of his own that he never throws away. <laughs> As a sideline, Nesfa has a rule when we move people. If a box has been moved twice and never opened, we will not move it again. <laughs> <laughs> we feel that it doesn't matter what's in there, it might as well contain nothing at all. 
And it, I used to come down and spend the weekends, you know, first with Mike Ward and then with you. And then when the um, at, at NESFA got started, I used to invite all of NESFA yeah. up to my home for a weekend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, I had up to 50 people, including Hal, I remember. Yeah. And we used to, uh, back then, the, uh, the NESFA meetings <coughs> always showed a movie. I remember that you brought up, I remember stretching a sheet on the living room wall and you were running a 16 millimeter movie projector to show a movie, you know, at my house. And one, one Nespa family always brought a tent and set up on my lawn, but everybody else was in my house, which was a four room house with one bedroom, with one bathroom. That was the one problem. And uh, so we had 50 Nespa there for a weekend, and usually in the summer. The basic problem was that Ellie and Shorter like to take showers for an hour and a half. And this is a problem <coughs> that 49 other people lined up to use the bathroom. Is this <laughs> the origin of the expression, Nesper is full of it? <laughs> <laughs> no, that goes back to the very yeah. beginning. I think Ted White <laughs> created that one. <laughs> I thought the famous Nespa phrase was, real soon now. <laughs> Those were called mesh cons, the ones that were held yeah. in Ed's house. But he also, there was also a... a Actually, I think it was a mesh con when I started growing my beard. Yeah. <laughs> there was a Tolkien Society yeah. conference. Okay, also, the very, when we started Locus, we started Locus in my backyard, sitting around during a mesh con in my, in my backyard. And um, well, two things, I, I had just taken over the, Tol the presidency of the Tolkien Society of America. Uh, and oh, uh, during it happened during New York. Um, Dick Plotz, a high school kid, started the Tolkien Society of America. His father was an MD in Brooklyn, New York. And when Dick graduated from high school, he went to Harvard. And running uh, the Tolkien Society while a freshman at Harvard took so much of, you know out of him. <laughs> that he basically almost, you know, he flunked most of his courses or got D's his freshman year in Harvard. And he had to redo his freshman year. But he said he had to give up the Tolkien Society and I said, okay, I'll run it. So at New York, during New York Con, at some Unitarian church in downtown Brooklyn, uh, he held the last meeting of the, his last meeting of the Tolkien Society and officially turned it over to me. And I moved it to Belknap College, and I was able to use a Belknap College nonprofit mailing permit, <laughs> then to mail out newsletters and things like that. And we decided when um, L.A. F F F N had started, there were, uh, there were a couple of very good, short-lived, fanish newsines out of L.A. Ron Elick and Bruce Pels were involved with them. One was Star Spinkle, and I don't remember the name of the other one. But they both, they started both of them by first, and both were one sheet of paper in an envelope. As soon as that sheet of paper was full, it was run off, you know, both two stencils were full, they were run off, and it was mailed out. And there was no Fanish newsletter. And we said, we felt we need a Fanish newsletter. Let us start one. And, we'll, that, and that was, of course, Locust. Locust started out as a purely Fanish newsletter. <laughs> to cover Hasn't news of fandom. Uh, and it was to be limited to one sheet of paper and when, you know, <laughs> two sides. And when that sheet of paper was full, it got run off and mailed out. And the very first one, we did two trial issues, you know, and before we asked for money to, to show a track record. That's what Ron Elick and Bruce Pels had done with Star Spinkle and, and Ratatosk. Those were the two. Star Spinkle and Ratatosk. Um, so we, the first trial, I still have about a hundred copies of the first trial issue of Locus in my house because those are the ones that uh, the post office returned because the people we mailed to them had moved. But if anyone wants a copy of the first trial issue of Locus, it was one sheet of paper plus it was accompanied by a one sheet flyer for my first Tolkien conference. Uh, better known as FlyCon. Charlie probably paid yeah, a huge Charlie amount. Charlie is uh, always out on the lookout for those early issues. Uh-huh. But I have about 100 copies of that first issue at home. 
first trial issue. It's not the first official yeah. issue. It's the first trial issue. Yeah, I think you'd love to have those. <coughs> yeah, but it says doesn't, doesn't already have one in the for a fanzine collection, that strikes me as a good thing to have. Mm. Yeah. So make sure people would um, just clear those others. We're being taped. Have, have, have the copies of yeah. them. Mm -hmm. But uh, then, yeah, uh, then uh, Belknap College was, um, it was started by two physicists, uh, Virginia Brigham and Royal Fry, and I think I think six, 59 or something like that. And I started teaching there in January of 62. And I bought an old estate, the old Tufts estate. When, when Tufts had made his money by inventing the soda fountain. And one of, one of the buildings was a little stone shed, which had been Tufts' workshop. And there was a big Georgian brick mansion and some farmhouses and so on. And all these buildings were converted into classrooms, and that was Belknap College. And they start, they'd started to put up their first building, which was five classrooms in a basement and a gymnasium auditorium at ground level. And uh, that building was not finished. It, they ran out of money, and it stood as a steel skeleton for a year and then got finished, and my Tolkien conference was the first official event held in Fry Hall, Fly Hall. which was you know, F-R-Y-E <laughs> after the founding president of the college. But the building had stood empty you know, as a shell for a year, and this was now fall, it was October, and um, the heat got turned on, and there were millions and millions of fly eggs <laughs> which, when the heat came on, all hatched. Uh, I knew there was some reason I was associating Belknap College and flies. <laughs> I couldn't remember what it was. <laughs> and so it became fly cod. You know, they, uh, the janitor in the morning would sweep up and fill a five-gallon bucket every morning with dead flies. <laughs> And we we partied at night, you know, at my house, uh, and we had the conference during the day in Fly Hall. Um, and it was during Fly Con that a lot of uh, uh, Lester Del Rey was there, Charlie Brown was there, uh, Marion Bradley was there. Who she, I don't remember Fred being there, but I remember uh, Charlie and Lester locking you up in my bedroom and not letting me in, and having maybe two other people in there, and working out the details on how to have a successful bid for Norris Con 1. But, uh, Sorry, Senator, I can't remember. <laughs> I remember being quite annoyed that I was excluded from this. This it was your own bedroom. Yes. <laughs> what, you think you're entitled to something? <laughs> During the, um, after we had won the bid for Nariscon 1, uh, and we were, uh, we announced our rates, um, we had, you would not believe how high the at-the-door rates were done for Nariscon 1. I believe it was maybe $10. We got this vehement letter attacking us from Ted White, saying there's, there's no possible way we could use all that money. I mean, <laughs> and it was clear that it was being used for personal gain and it was all going into the Tony Lewis Travel Fund. And not only that, but our offices and especially our treasurer was probably a corrupt and evil person. Well, the treasurer, there's, there was our treasurer at the time. Well. We had to kick Harry off the committee, I'll tell you why later. Uh, but at the meeting, one of the members got up and said, do not respond to Ted White. If Ted White needs to be responded to per in public, I will respond to Ted White and take him into little shreds. Thank you very much. We said, thank you very much, Isaac. Uh, because he did not like me being called names by Ted White. No. Harry had a, a novel called Starlight. 
and I got nominated for the Yugo. Now the rules were that if you were on the committee, you weren't eligible to have your story nominated for Yugo. So go to Harry and say, here's the problem. And he says, well, perhaps I should withdraw the story. <laughs> we said, no, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Fred Isaacs became the treasurer. Um, that's my only Ted White story. And, but he did this for future years, too. I know he attacked L.A. Con, who charged him too much money. Um, yeah, I used to write editorials in PB explaining why Ted White and all his crew were uh, scum of the earth, and he would write indignant letters saying why uh, I was scum of the earth. And, but it was... Uh, very fattish. Very fattish, it's a... Yes. <laughs> we watched it tell us the time. The nation oh. that controls magnetism will rule the... <laughs> <laughs>